please identify yourself. Sure. When you... I don't really need a microphone. Um, I'm Hilaf as a collective of Vancouver Red Police, and I'm cheating because I have comments instead of questions. But I'm sure one of them I can just add a question mark at the end. Jen, I, I wanted to respond to two things that you said. I think you had a very useful analysis about the relationship between women's hating and sexism and homophobia. I think um, violence against dark women and violence against gay men is because they're rejecting heterosexuality, which is one of the most, especially in couple dominant family, one of the most effective uh, oppressive mechanism against women. So I thought it's a useful feminist analysis. And the other thing that I wanted to talk is about the film. I saw many of the short high school films at the Queer Film Festival, and I think they're very effective. And I'm appreciating traditionally when there are public education work like this, it's usually empathy for the lesbian girl or, or the gay boy. And the fact that you chose whomever is behind this project cho chose to call to an activist stand up against the oppression is very useful. And, and for my experience, teenagers are way more bold than adult to take a stand and to reject um, unacceptable behavior. But this, oh yeah, I found the question. This film and, and others that I saw mainly perform, mainly um, uh, showed boys. Yeah, that's it. So I'm interested about in this and if there was a particular offer to show lesbian girls or not and what were the thought behind it? Sometimes it's just habit, habitual conventions. 
and, um, and availability, just who's, who's answering the phone, who's willing to go on the news. It's a combination of those things. And, and journalists definitely have to do better because you can easily find sources in the areas where there's a much higher representation. Mm -hmm. Hi, Melissa Valley. I was wondering if, uh, I think one of the panelists touched on uh, there's this dissonance between how many young women are interested in journalism and how many actually end up happens in between enthusiastic young students and actual practicing in the field and what can be done about that. And I would open that up to say in media generally, in you know, cultural media as well as journalism because it's, there's the same kind of gap. So that's a really good question. And at the risk of scooping the study that's part of the International Women's Media Foundation <laughs> that I can't scoop, um, you know, we're seeing shifts in terms of the proportion of women in news. Um, at the entry level, up into the middle management, we're seeing parity, we're seeing 50-50. So women, actually, women in journalism schools are getting into the profession. They are moving up to a middle management role. There are key invisibility areas still, and again, I can't go into them, they'll be released in March. But the big challenge is still the glass ceiling in certain areas. And so what happens is, in, like in other areas, you know, when women will leave their career to either have a family or for various reasons, then they'll go into corporate communications or public relations. And that's still, that's an issue. So, so the good news is that there's much more women at up to limited management. The bad news is that if they're still leaving in the senior executive, the news agenda setting roles basically in terms of mainstream media. Uh, what we've seen uh, from the studies that I've seen anyway in the cultural industries is that uh, women are graduating from Film schools, uh, independent film schools, and universities in about equal proportion to men. Um, there's been a real improvement there. I think the numbers are between 40 and 50 percent women graduating from these schools, but we're not seeing those numbers translate into the workforce. And I think the honest truth is we don't really know why yet. It's one of the panels we had at our conference was to ask that exact question: is, you know, why are we graduating so many women? as directors, as producers, as cinematographers, but they're not getting work. Uh, and we, we don't know. I, I think that it's, a, it's a actually a really complex answer. I think there's all sorts of realities around the structure of the production industry that make it less attractive for a lot of women, particularly around life balance questions or raising children questions. You, know, you don't necessarily find working 19 hours a day to forward your career very attractive after a while because that's actually what it takes. Um, and I think that there are structural issues and systemic issues. I think that there's a stereotype that women can't direct. You know, I've heard from a lot of broadcasters that, oh, well, we kind of get that women can produce now, but there just aren't any women directors, which is yes, you know, but they, the stereotype hasn't changed, so it's much harder for women to bring it. Uh, my name is Emma Ninnan. I'm an uh, undergraduate political science student at SFU. And uh, I know we touched briefly on, on stereotypes of men and women that are presented in the media. And I kind of had a bit of a twofold question. Um, one is, uh, is I, I was wondering if you would care to comment on the foil of sort of traditional masculinity in the family movies that you were looking at. We, 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 talked, we talked about the uh, the women being in sexually revealing clothing and, and having partial nudity and, and all of these things that um, that are really problematic in the depiction of women. But um, how how is that correlated to problematic depictions of masculinity as well? And then I also wanted to ask on the news representation side um, about that traditional view of masculinity um, that's often seen as the objective view and then everything else is alternative. And um, that we, we even use that language as alternative media depictions. But why is this, or would you care to comment on, on why this one point of view, which is generally white, heterosexual, cisgendered, male, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, why is that objective?
sort of addresses the need to look at men because the way men are being represented in the media is also changing, it's also becoming hypersexualized, but I think there's still a lot of research to do on that, so that's my non-answer. Yeah, and, and, I was, and I was also sort of uh, curious, and I understand if you can't answer this as well on this, uh, sort of how, um, not just how men are depicted, but how it is then problematic for women, particularly, how it sort of relates back and forth. And you may not be able to answer that either. I was just uh, curious about the subject. Great question. I mean, the history of objectivity in news is, is inextricably intertwined with heterosexual masculinity, and women have been marginalized, um, made invisible through that. So it's, it's embedded in sort of how journalism has been conceptualized over the past century. So, I mean, it's a white guy, women's pages, it's white guy, women doing that kind of emotional human interest story as opposed to the hard news political story. And, you know, a lot of studies show that, you know, news you know, represents the status quo, basically reinforces the status quo. So I think we have to constantly, you know, fight in newsrooms to try and change that. And it's, it's still a challenge. Um, I just want to say that's a fabulous comment slash question. And we may not all be able to answer it. And, um, but I think with the, I guess, the reiteration of masculinity in the media and how you're asking how it, uh, I guess, affects women and women's roles. And I would, I would even go as far as to say that it affects men's roles as well. Um, but just you touching upon, I guess, all the identities and power, all the cisgender, the white, and the heterosexual identities, it's, it's very poignant uh, to point out is that we can see, we can see that representation in just basically um, transformed in that hegemonic power structure, right? And so when we're talking about that, we can see it precisely in transgender identities that's non-represented or misrepresented in society or in media. And I would actually go as far as to say we see much more um, of women being portrayed uh, and femininity being purity and portrayed. And so drag queens are always on the big screens. It can be, it's always out there. But you never, rarely ever see drag kings or king or any of that play uh, in, in social media and mainstream media, whether uh, that's television, film, or whatever. But you will have these subcultures um, or sub-subcultures um, of alternative communities, so to speak. Um, that are very much effect effective, effectively utilizing drag king as, an, as a way to expose masculinity. And the, the power of masculinity is then completely eradicated, which is fucking fantastic. <laughs> Apologies. Um, and so, we don't have a weaker. Great, love that. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm saying this appropriately or, or properly, but um, definitely I think that we're, we're seeing a movement now towards recognizing transgender identities and the fluidity between uh, the two genders and that we're starting now to understand that there's still a lot of work, obviously, but we're starting now to have a movement, at least in academic circles and in, in subculture communities, uh, towards recognizing that there's more than two genders and that there's more flexibility and that goes beyond that to those two dichotomies, right? Thank you. Come to them with uh, an idea about maybe adding more diversity or being more complex in the way you talk about stereotypes of these relationships, it's, in my experience, often rejected, and not because they don't get that that's the real world, but they think audiences won't like it. It's like, no, the audience will just turn the channel, it's too complicated, gotta say pass. So that's sort of another layer of why this stuff happens. Uh, my name is Lita Helquist. I'm a student of SFU, and I'm in the sciences, so I'm probably completely over my head. <laughs> um, I had previously had an assumption that's probably incorrect, that women in media was almost directly related to the education of the women in the culture. Um, but I was surprised by the statistics uh, of women in media in Canada versus internationally, in that there wasn't that much of a change, despite the fact that women in Canada, on average, are more educated. So what are some of the other factors that are holding women back, um, particularly internationally, from being in the media, besides education? The arts. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> 
Oh, you want me to take that? Okay. So, um, well, there's. A, I think you're talking about the um, the chart I put up and that the the, the distinction. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, this the. We're doing, we were doing a study on representation, so we didn't do a study on, on why women, um, women's experience in, in journalism or in the labor market. They're certainly being educated, and, uh, certain, and I think Mary Lynn's work with Catherine Murray, who's also here, uh, will, will, will an answers that question better. But there's certainly issues around glass ceiling, there are certainly issues mentioned around the type of stories women journalists get. If you look at some of the studies from the Global Media Monitoring Project, the sort of stories where you found women journalists tend to be the traditional, some soft sister type stories, but but even more um, uh, be not being used as, as um, uh, it not getting stories about politics, uh, tending to be relegated to stories about uh, family life. So, so the opportunities also aren't being reflected in the kinds of stories that, journal, uh, that women journalists are getting. Uh, so that may be part of the reason why they're leaving. Um, other than that, it's, it, it's, the, it's what we're trying to grapple with. It's, it, it's what is it about the masculist culture, masculinist culture of media that is um, limiting and restricting opportunities for women both within the media industries and in terms of representation? It's a, it's a big question. Go ahead. I'm just trying to wrap my head around uh, something that you, you said about education and, and women in Canada having more education than other parts of the world. Because to me, that's a huge, first of all, that's wrong. Um, and I don't, I'm not trying to call you out or anything, but I just think as the only racialized woman sitting on this panel, um, I think that's pretty safe to say that education is not only limited to Canadian women, but it's also it's it affects all women across the world, right? And mm -hmm. so I think to say that um, I'm not sure if I'm wording this right, but to say that women outside of Canada has limited access or lesser access to education is is um, 